Good. Yep. Okay. All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone here at DPFL. Good morning, also everyone who's remote or or uh, you know whichever. Which I, I don't actually know which time zone you're in remotely. So, but good morning from Switzerland. So um, it's my pleasure to open this third um, workshop and meeting of the ITU uh, focus group uh, AI for Health in collaboration with WHO. Um, our chair, Thomas Wiegand, is on its way. He was on a night train and had some connection problems, as night trains tend to have, but he'll be with us very shortly. But we begin, of course, the session. And um, I'd just like to say a few words, um, maybe first administrative. You, I think you've seen the Wi-Fi password. Um, if you haven't, um, someone will know, and certainly the tech team in the back will know. Um, there are, of course, security exits, as always. Uh, there are bathrooms in this building, amazingly, um, if you go outside and then somewhere on the left and the right. And I was also sure there will be coffee in the first break. Good. So um, let me briefly start with just a very brief history where we find ourselves today. So this focus group, AI for Health, was created um, just a few months ago, actually, which is kind of stunning given that we're in the third meeting. Um, but it was created uh, in July 2018 following the AI for Good conference in Geneva. And um, following its creation, we had the first workshop and meeting at WHO here in the headquarters in Geneva. This was in September. This was a very good meeting. It was sort of setting the stage, setting the scene. Um, and of course, as always, you can find all the documents um, of all the discussions and all the input documents and output documents on the on the ITU website. Um, the second workshop we had a couple of months ago. We had a couple of months ago um, at Columbia University. Our colleagues um, graciously hosted us in New York City. This was uh, middle November. Um, this was also a very good meeting, and there. We, um, of course, continued the work, but we also selected the first few projects that were submitted in response to a call uh, proposals that we had launched after the Geneva meeting. We then launched another call for projects, and that's uh, something that we will be discussing in this meeting. And for those of you who are new to this, as was I and I think many here in this room, so the idea is always to have the first day of workshops um, where we speak and bring in people with expertise that um, we uh, identified as very important for the next steps or the overall picture. And um, and then the, the, the following days are the official meeting days. So today... We're, of course, in the workshop, and that's where we find ourselves in this third workshop and meeting, and this is the workshop day here in Lausanne. We already know where the fourth uh, workshop and meeting will be. That will be in Shanghai. Um, our Chinese colleagues will host us there. We're looking very much forward to this. This will be early April. I believe it's uh, second to fifth. Is that correct? Yep. So it's more than belief. It is correct. And it um, will then be followed by other meetings down the line. The next one probably in Geneva, but the details have to be announced. And we're looking for um, other locations for the follow-up meetings. We'd like, it makes sense that many of those meetings um, or the meetings are regularly again here, given the ITU and WHO location, but we'd like to go, um, of course, around the world because we um, thought, and this was, of course, confirmed, that it's very important to be in different locations to bring the local stakeholders in. And so, you know, stay tuned for um, new locations coming up, um, and they will, of course, always be posted on the ITU website. 
So for this particular meeting, I in particular would like to thank EPFL and the EPFL Tech for Impact group, which has not only organized this, but EPFL has also financed this. I, I have to say, you know, it is a beautiful building, but it does not belong to EPFL. We have to rent it. It's very nice. It's not quite cheap. Um, and so we're, um, we're very grateful for EPFL for, for the support they have given us uh, to host this meeting here. In particular, also Beatrice, who's been um, super involved and sort of the key person making this happen, but also Julia Binder, who heads the team there, and Mark Gruber, who's the vice president for innovation, who's sort of overseeing everything that's innovation uh, at EPFL. So thanks very much. Good. So um, I think I'm going to sort of close it there with the welcome. Um, if there are any questions, um, you know, please ask them later. And of course, we'll have a break in a short amount of time. And we're still an overseeable group in terms of size, so it shouldn't be a worry. Now, um, we let me start with my um, with my talk on benchmarking. So this is what I'm a bit. Um, well, I wouldn't say responsible for, but it's sort of a bit the hat I have on in this focus group. And to explain a little bit um, what it is we want to do, um, this is then followed by two other talks on, on sort of broad overviews of the focus group and also a particular view from the medical side of things. So um, some of you have seen these slides, I've adapted them a little bit, um, but I think it's worth reflecting again on this because it's sort of key to, to, to the operation. So we find ourselves here in a time um, where modern AI, what we speak about, certainly the AI for health that we speak about, by and large, we're talking about deep learning. And um, these are these artificial neural or neural networks, depending which you prefer. These are networks that are trained on typically massive amounts of data. And then, you know, put it very simply, are basically just a very glorious function that can map uh, some input to output. But what we found in the past 10 years, and I think to possibly the great surprise of everybody, although in retrospect, there are always people who say they were not surprised, um, is how well this works and in how many different domains. Um, and fundamentally, what one does is one trains these networks and one uses um, software for that on lots of data. Um, and the output are these models that um, are doing an excellent job in um, you know, taking this particular function. Let's say we're talking about this, uh, an image recognition problem and can apply it to images, so new input that this um, model has never seen and give um, the correct output in you know, sufficiently high number of times. So this, uh, this question around accuracy of, of this uh, whole idea. So we're talking about software and we're talking about data. The software nowadays um, is something that's very accessible um, these frameworks that you can use to train these networks. Um, you don't have to build from scratch anymore. Of course, you still can. Some people do. Um, but um, there have been um, some open libraries that are now used broadly in academia, in, um, in industry, and in other domains, such as TensorFlow that's been released by Google, PyTorch that's been spearheaded a bit by Facebook and so on. There are many others. These are just two of the most popular ones. So these are generally open frameworks. Um, so you can download them and you can start um, you know, training it on your data. And that's typically where the problem begins, um, which data. And so you may be in a, in a situation where you have privileged access to data, and that's good for you and your organization. You may be in a situation where you don't have that, and then you uh, need to go and find some open data. But that's by and large the situation today. A bit simplified, of course, but um, that's what it is. And so these networks, um, there's not a day... Uh, I used to say there's not a week where some big announcement um, comes. Now I would say there's not a day or probably even multiple per day. And they're always um, looking a bit the same, but I took this uh, figure from a, 
a paper that just came out a few weeks ago. So the, fundamentally, the idea is that you have these networks, you have some input, and then eventually this 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 information gets mathematically transformed into some output. And um, here's another um, figure from that same paper. So here you can perhaps better see that the input could, for example, be medical images. And here you see a few of these examples. And they're sort of then pushed through these networks. And at the end, you have some output layer. And that output layer could be, for example, different classes of possible diagnoses. Um, and this is an end-to-end -end process, and that confuses a lot of people um, in general because it is actually something that we're not so used to. It means we really go from one end of this entire pipeline, which is the input of the data, to the other end of the pipeline, which is the output. So, for example, just the diagnosis in this case. And the entire network, the, the network does the entire job end to end. So there's no actual expertise that's in somehow built into this network other than the expertise that the network itself um, attained or obtained from training on many, many annotated images, for example, in the case of image recognition. And that has all kinds of really deep implications that go way beyond uh, the pure technology um, that are typically sort of under the banner of AI and jobs and so on. But this is not our main concern here. It is, of course, a concern for all of us, but it's not the concern of this focus group. The focus group uh, concern um, is here a bit on this slide. What I just mentioned is literally something you can do today um, and you can download this free software and you download, um, you get access to some open, even medical data, you can start training your networks. If you're a bit tech savvy, you can, you can of course, um, package this into an app and load it up to the App Store and boom, now the entire world has access to a seemingly medical application that you built yourself. And that's, to some extent, something very exciting, right? Because that means, really, it's this very permissible um, area where people can do this kind of work without any formal training, without any credentials, without anything. There's no more gatekeepers. And in many ways, this is, of course, something that's uh, fundamentally very good and interesting. But it comes, of course, with the flip side of the coin, which is because it is such an extremely dynamic field and everyone can basically do whatever they want, um, it is a bit of a Wild West situation, if I can use this, this metaphor for lack of a better alternative. But anything goes, really. Um, you can publish your algorithm in, you know, on the web. You can package it in apps, as I mentioned. You can maybe wrap an API around it and make it openly accessible. And this confuses uh, also a lot of people. It confuses in particular the patients. It confuses, of course, physicians, the medical system. It confuses regulators um, because they say, okay, what are we going to do with this? Um, and there are understandably now calls for transparency, regulation, and so on. And these are important calls, but the focus group feels like there's something that can be done um, in parallel that's possibly um, faster and uh, less bureaucratic. And um, the solution, and this is why I'm, uh, why I'm here and why I'm giving this talk. I mean, this is a multifaceted problem, okay? I'm not just saying this is a technical uh, solution. But the technical solution, if there is one, is in the form of these benchmarks, where we can say, okay, we need, if, if really anything goes, and this is a, a free technology, which it is, cats out of the bag, um, then at least, I mean, the best we can do, certainly in the beginning, is to say, okay, we need to benchmark these solutions. Um, and we need to benchmark them in a way where we as stakeholders come in and say, okay, let's, we cannot, um, the cat's out of the back with the technology, and to some extent that's a good thing, but let's uh, not wait until the cat's out of the back with the benchmarks. Let's come together as these various stakeholders and define this one benchmark that we can all agree upon. Because once we have this benchmark, it could open up all kinds of interesting avenues where we say, okay, I mean, if you, you know, let's say you take a 
particular vertical in medicine. It could be, for example, skin cancer recognition. And we can agree on a benchmark, and I'll speak about that. And and actually, the various stakeholders in the world, the WHOs and the dermatology associations and so on, agree and say, this is the benchmark we we can get behind. Then all of a sudden, if you're coming with an app that's supposed to you know detect cancer, um, sure, you may put this on, on an app store on the web, but if you want to have some kind of you know soft approval, at least, from this group, then you would need to bring it to the group so it can be benchmarked. And, um, and we would argue that if we have such benchmarks and such solutions, that would really bring a lot of clarity to the field. This is in one slide how we think it's going to work. Of course, the reality is it's going to be much more complicated. Um, but there's basically this whole process where you train your uh, model on data um, and then you submit it. Um, to the platform or to the platforms that this group manages. Your model will then be evaluated typically on an undisclosed test, test set. It will receive an evaluation, which you can use. Um, it could appear also on a leaderboard if that's something that the group wishes to do. Um, but it certainly would also help you then retrain the model if you are not happy with the results. But this is sort of a, uh, an iterative process. I'll just say a few words about each step, but then I'm finished. Um, but it's important. So, so let's just begin with the data. You may say, well, okay, this is interesting, but I don't have data and I would like to participate. And this is inherently a hard problem. And we as a focus group cannot come and say, well, here's your data, um, because we don't have that data either. So, um, what we can do certainly as a group is to again, bring stakeholders on board and say, is there data in your domain that you identify as high quality data? Um, so that first of all helps us, you know, even make it visible. And secondly, do you in fact have data that's high quality and that you would be willing to put out in the open uh, under the uh, umbrella, for example, of this focus group? But certainly that's that's the best we can do uh, to help identify, but we can of course not prevent others from having private data and that's also not in our interest uh, to do that. Okay, so uh, participants can then build their models. And again, these can be new participants coming into the field, or of course these can be established participants, established companies, organizations that say, well, we have already models for problem X, Y, Z. Um, and you can then um, transmit this model to the um, to the focus group, so we can evaluate it. So again, what does that mean? Actually, this evaluation, and this this is very likely the most important step from a technical perspective here. Step four is again, it's not that we have any ambition um, whatsoever to look at your model and take it apart. Um, we don't care about these models per se. We're not going to develop our own models. All we want is we want to take your model and we want to execute it on this undisclosed test set that's been vetted by the relevant stakeholders. And then sort of come back and say, this is your benchmark value. Whatever that benchmark is, this, by the way, is also something that the stakeholders have to agree upon. What is it that's going to be measured? Well, again, we don't know. I have relatively little understanding of dermatology, so it clearly shouldn't fall to me what uh, should be measured. It should fall to the relevant stakeholders to say, this is what an algorithm needs to do. And this, by the way, is something that can change over time. We can start with simple cancers, non-cancerous, and over time can get into very complex benchmarks. So this is essential. It's essential that this is an undisclosed data set uh, because that allows us to really have the highest in integrity and, and quality and confidentiality. And something that we haven't really spoken about in the past couple of meetings, but that I added here is this fairness. I'll say um, a word about this. But, but the idea here is really that we can actually, there's actually a way we can ensure unbiased algorithms. Thanks for this. 
this is my last this will be on my last slide so then um, again you you get back the the test uh, result following this evaluation and again we can or cannot put it on a leaderboard typically leaderboards in these types of benchmarks have to have shown to be very uh, something very positive uh, and we have to find ways to make sure that maybe there's some anonymous way to do that. But certainly what helps a lot is to put the values out there. Because it really, once you say, um, this is, this is the best an algorithm currently has done. This, this is an incredible, um, psychological trick to move everyone forward. Uh, and we've seen this again and again when we've run benchmarks outside of medical fields where people said, okay, you know, we probably can, this is probably how good it can get. And then suddenly someone comes in and says, my solution does this. And everybody sees this and it just completely changes the game, I guess, in, in a similar way that in sports, once somebody beats a record, all of a sudden everybody matches that record. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's, uh, it's been shown again and again. Okay, so these are my last slides now. The benefits of this proposed model is, again, this process is open and inclusive. That's, to some extent, by the design of the focus group, as um, you can much learn, learn much more from the ITU colleagues, but um, these ITU focus groups are completely open to everyone. Um, and the, this process itself is open and inclusive and, and of course, completely transparent. If successful, our notion is that it will add substantial clarity to the field so that you don't have to guess anymore, like how well does a particular algorithm work, you know, if they're benchmarked, you know. Um, and again, this, this notion that we, um, sh that we will set this up in such a way that you can, that we can execute your model and your code on undisclosed data sets. That's a huge asset because it allows us actually to replicate the results. And, um, you know, many of those benchmarks in the past have been such that, you know, for example, some, let's, let's say we're talking about some image recognition benchmark that at the end, you know, the organizers have released some images without annotations and people have to upload their annotations. And then you could go and see, okay, who performed how well. The trick there is that you'll never know how these results came to be. You don't know if they've been obtained in a fair way. You don't know if they've been obtained, um, you know, in a way that's, that's even technically feasible, you know, in a realistic time frame, given constraints and so on. I mean, you just don't know. However, if you if you are if you're able to execute code you can do all kinds of tests behind the scenes to ensure that this code or that this model really performs well so this is a key asset and that, that there's no way for cheating because this model will then be executed in this secret and secure environment and this is something we'll have to talk about uh, in these days as well how to make that technically feasible and this really is my last slide. Um, so the process can ensure maximum amount of fairness. And that I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat sad that I put this as my last slide because I would say it's my most important slide. But um, th this sentence there is really quite important. If we build unbiased data sets, then um, your algorithm in order to perform well in that benchmark will have to be unbiased. At the, and I think there's a key difference, right? At the moment, there are all these calls for unbiased um, algorithms. And these are, of, co of course, absolutely justified calls. We don't want biased algorithms. But what can we do? We can just go, well, please, all of you who build models, make sure that your data is unbiased. That's the best we can hope for. But if we can actually say, well, okay, if we have this benchmarking pipeline and we ensure that our test set on which we evaluate these models is unbiased, well, then if your, if your algorithm is supposed to perform well, it will have to be unbiased. It cannot be unbiased. If it's unbiased, it will not perform well. So that's sort of a way for us to take back uh, the, 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 a bit the control over that whole, uh, that whole discussion. And not just discussion, I mean, actually really making sure these algorithms can be um, unbiased. Okay, I hope I didn't promise anything wrong. No, this was my last slide. 
So um, with that, I'm now handing the word to Naomi Lee from The Lancet, who's um, recently joined us as a vice chair of this focus group. And then at the, we have a third speaker, and at the end, we'll be here in the panel for discussion. Thank you. Marcel, thank you very much, first of all, for hosting us here at EPFL in these fantastic facilities, and secondly, for a really fantastic introduction to the work of the focus group. As Marcel said, I'm Naomi Lee. I was a surgeon working in the UK's National Health Service for around 10 years, and I left five years ago to join the Lancet. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. But I think one of the things that excites us most about this focus group is when we talk about AI and health, it requires the intersection of two very different fields. So first of all, that of artificial intelligence, and then secondly, that of health. And I think one of the things that we've seen so far in the field is that we haven't successfully leveraged this, this interaction. And what we hope to do within the focus group is really bring those two fields together. That's why I'm involved in the focus group. So one of the reasons that I uh, left uh, the National Health Service was really being frustrated with the kind of scale of change that we could achieve as individual clinicians. And that's one of the things that's very different at The Lancet. It's the leading independent general medical journal. And when I say that, I mean it's not society owned. It doesn't have any members which it has to please. Um, so in a way, we have a lot of academic freedom. But we operate within this very strict world of the academic medical journal. So what does that mean? When we think about innovations in medicine, we generally understand that they pass through these sequential stages of medical research. So we, they have what we regard as these preclinical stages where they happen either in the lab or in the dry lab, and then passes through these sequential phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. We end up doing a randomized control trial that enters the medical literature as guidelines. It gets adopted as clinical best practice. So there is a number of checkpoints along the way. Obviously, there's regulations for, from the FDA, from the EMA, those show that it's safe, but does it show that it's the better or best than the current treatment? No. That's really the role of academic medical publishing. And um, what the academic medical publishing does is publishes these kind of comparative effectiveness studies. Why hasn't there been a digital revolution in health? Really because of the difference of, between what Marcel talked about with this Wild West system and this procedure that I've just explained to you about how medical innovation and research gets adopted. Medical research has to be slow and conservative. What Geraldine McKinty said to us at the last meeting from the American College of Radiologists is tech, the, the kind of mantra in tech is to fail fast, but that's absolutely the opposite of what you want to do in health. We would rather be much more conservative because the risk of failing is a risk of mortality or morbidity, so we don't want to fail at all. So we are slow and conservative because we can't afford to fail. And I think that brings us on to what Marcel said about why there has been no digital revolution. So in every other sector, we've seen this digital revolution. But when we see a Wild West environment, those are the, that's the kind of environment that cannot and won't translate into health changes because clinicians are naturally conservative because of the risks involved. So what we're trying to do here in this field, I think everybody working in it is trying to balance regulation with innovation. So we understand that we want to continue with a low benchmark for entry to the field, but we want to do that in a setting where there's sufficient regulations that clinicians can adopt innovations with confidence. So how does that tie with the work of the uh, focus group? So we know that artificial intelligence is fast to develop, it's very adaptable, the progress of the digital systems means that it can be done at scale rather than the kind of current model with these randomized control trials that take 20 years from kind of initi initiation to delivery of results. So we know that the model is completely different and we know that we need to adapt our system, but this time the gain is very great. Much of medicine is about classification, it's about prediction, it's about class understanding who is healthy and who isn't, and who can benefit from an intervention and who won't. So when we think about these different use cases, some of which we're going to hear about later on in the applications and use case session, we're thinking about how uh, AI can be used for interpretation of images, which is the cornerstone of specialties like radiology, uh, retinal scans and ophthalmology. We're understanding how uh, artificial intelligence can be used for prediction of uh, the risk of a disease, calculation of the risk from data sources which are not conventional like blood tests or the electronic health record. We're thinking about prediction of epidemics, which is something that we don't do at the moment. We're entirely reactive. 
we're thinking about targeting public health interventions, not by broad demographics like age and gender, but directly to the population that's at risk. And the, fun the, the fundamental change there uh, is something that is worth the investment. You can understand how medicine is a problem around classification, which lends itself so well to the advantages of artificial intelligence, and ultimately arrives at this idea of precision public health, precision global health, precision medicine. So knowing who will get a disease, when it's going to be clinically significant, which is the intervention which is best for that person. If we think about a use case like prostate cancer, we know that prostate cancer is incredibly common. We know that the biggest problem in prostate cancer is over and yet many people still die of prostate cancer. So how can we leverage artificial intelligence to understand who is at risk of prostate cancer? What's the most appropriate imaging for them? What's the most appropriate uh, intervention? Is it an operative intervention? Is it watchful waiting? Uh, we, this is a problem that's been unsolved by the current uh, medical research setting. So how does the work of the focus group support this? Well, as I said, clinicians in the medical community are conservative and we work with standards and evidence. So establishing a base mark, a, a benchmark like this, uh, acts as a quality stamp for artificial intelligence algorithms. It does two things for the community on the two halves. First of all, it gives clinicians confidence that the algorithms perform well for the use case. And the second is that it allows the developers and data scientists to develop, to demonstrate that their algorithm is robust. And it does this in a setting where you have these two communities that at present don't have a common language, so we don't have a common metric for success. The, art, the metric for success within the artificial intelligence community might be accuracy of prediction or F1, the accuracy, the metric of success in the medical community is uh, years of life saved, uh, avoidance of morbidity, avoidance of mortality. So those are different uh, settings in which we have different measures of success. So when we think about how we create this culture where it's robust assessment and subsequent adoption, we need to understand how the benchmark fits with other previously established um, previously established settings for adoption. Since the last meeting that we had in uh, Columbia, we've had conversations with the American College of Radiology. They're great proponents of AI, and what they say is that the world is going to be divided into those who work with artificial intelligence and those who don't. And in the future, the ones who don't will be the ones who can't work at the same scale or the same precision as those do. And they understand, we now understand how they've created use cases around these common clinical problems. For example, the diagnosis of prostate cancer on multiparametric MRI, uh, the diagnosis for, of um, uh, multiple sclerosis from an MRI, and we understand how this could be used to assess algorithms. We understand that this work also dovetails well with the more traditional requirements. So thinking about the equator network, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, this sets out the reporting standards for any medical research. There isn't currently one for AI, but we know that the closest is for prediction from things like multi, from logistic regression. And the requirements for that are that the algorithm or the predictive algorithm must be tested in an independent data set. So we can see how the focus group provides that facility to people who don't have access to an otherwise independent data set. We know this requires use cases. We know it requires data on which to test. And we know it requires algorithms to verify. So we know the focus group has a lot of work to do. But the work of the focus group with your support is to turn this into a fully functioning system. Why is it incumbent on us to do this? First of all, the risks of unbenchmarked data are very high. When you think about the current setting for AI or digital interventions, many of them are targeted directly at patients. And the reason for that is because it's easier to, it's easier to provide the evidence for regulation or the evidence for adoption for those patient targeted systems. That's fine. It does place patients at risk if we adopt a different standard for things that are marketed direct to patients than we do that are marketed direct to clinicians. But it also provides a risk of not building on the possibilities of artificial intelligence in health. So when we think about all the possibilities for digital in health and we think about the lack of change that's happened. I think if we don't think about the correct regulation, if we don't think about the correct benchmarking, if we don't think about how we fit this new world with the current more conservative system and how they work together to create a new system, then we run the risk of no uptake. And so standing here in 10 years and saying it was a cycle of hype instead of leveraging the possibilities. Thank you.
morning, everyone. I'm Markus Wenzel from Fraunhofer Society um, in Berlin, Germany. Um, I want to use this opportunity to introduce you to the pro process um, of the focus group, so the single steps that we plan to do in the two-year lifetime. Mm. Um, so um, what have we done so far? In the last months, what are we going to, ne to do next? What are our objectives? And most importantly, um, how can you all get involved? Um, I was asked by uh, the chairman of the Fox Group to um, jump in and um, give his talk. So it will be a bit of an uh, improvisation. Um, um, and, but he will join us uh, later. So he missed the train connection. Bastian, can you? Uh, I have a clicker. Great. So um, we, we learned that AI offers a large um, potential for improving health, for diagnostics, for early detection, for risk assessment, um, for um, self-management, and so on. And we learned from Marcel's talk that um, it's required to ever evaluate these artificial intelligence uh, system in a standardized way that um, it, the technology get um, adopted um, worldwide and with confidence so that I as a patient or physicians um, can use this technology um, and trust and know what they can expect, what are the limits. And the focus group is an open platform, so everybody can get involved um, if you managed, and I think you all did, if you managed to break in the ITU um, registration process. Um, so, um, and during, we, we tried during the lifetime of two years to um, um, create um, a standardized framework for benchmarking or evaluation of AI. And we will do this um, in a, in German we would say Blaupause, so we will uh, not cover the whole field uh, because of the uh, limited time. So we will exercise this on um, some selected representative examples, and then we can scale and go um, and cover all, all possible use cases. Um, yes. So um, but, um, Marcel already introduced you to um, what um, AI does. So he, he showed the, the networks with the pictures on one side or the input data, um, um, which could be, for example, x-rays, um, lab measurements, um, text, um, you name it. And then we have the AI, and this is basically a mapping from the data x to some output variable. In a classification task, this could be like um, uh, ill versus sick, or it could be mapped to the um, ICD codes or the international classification of diseases. Um, or if you if you are not um, dealing with di diagnostics, but um, if you're uh, um, supporting decision making, um, you could take uh, take the data and map it to a diagnosis and then give a recommendation what to do, for example, in self-management or um, in treatment decision-making. So in this case, the data would be mapped to um, um, international classification of health intervention codes. And what we want to do is we want to evaluate this mapping from data to output variables w without inspecting the AI te technology itself. And we will... So Marcel introduced uh, the loop um, of the evaluation. I will introduce you now to the, to the steps um, that we will take to establish this loop framework. So what we have achieved so far is step one. We have invited proposals for use cases and data. We selected already um, um, some relevant use cases. And we're in the process of collecting undisclosed test data per use case. And what has to be done next is to uh, publish a description of the format of the test data. So we will not publish the test data itself, 
for uh, obvious reasons. And we will tell the AI developers what kind of output variables they are expected to generate with their models. And this is, I mean, ITU is a standardization body, WHO is a standardization body as well. So we will agree on benchmarking metrics for comparisons that work for um, all the stakeholders around the use cases. So that involves competing um, companies, that involves um, academics, uh, physicians, AI de developers. So this is the idea to bring uh, these people together, the, the stakeholders, that they meet and agree. Um, once we have done this, um, we will invite submissions of AI technology, set up the framework, and finally, um, benchmark um, the AI with the undisclosed test data, so the holdout data. And in this framework, the AI will generate output variables Y from the undisclosed test data X, and we will compare this output with the ground truth. So these are uh, labels or annotations given by human experts, physicians, and so on. And um, we are here um, an ITU and WHO um, body. So reports and specifications um, provide a transparent documentation. And this is, so it's document driven. So if you go on the website and log in on the collaboration site, you will find all uh, what we have done so far um, completely transparent. Um, everybody can read it. Um, yeah, Marcel already introduced uh, what um, that we had hold two meetings in fast pace. So we do this every two months, more or less, uh, worldwide um, in Geneva, uh, New York, now here in Lausanne, in Shanghai. On, on the collaboration website, I found a document for an invitation to India um, for um, autumn. So um, we, we hope to get um, the global community involved. So check the website for updates. Um, okay, so I will give a brief um, summary of what we have achieved so far. So we hold a constructive meeting, set up the basic operation and structure, um, gave a workshop like this with talks, published a white paper that is also posted on archive. You can read it and it will be continuously improved. We um, created output uh, drafts for documents that are will be continuously improved. For example, I was working with, with Mark on a data policy document. And we um, put out the um, call for proposals for use cases. So this is where everyone is invited to, to, to submit the use case and get involved. At meeting B in New York, we had a workshop um, like this um, um, again. Um, we had um, 15 submissions of use cases within a short time and uh, selected eight use cases and then again um, sent out an updated call for proposal. So and during the next days, we will, will um, have a look at these uh, new uh, submissions. Here's a summary of um, projects adopted for an initial fe feasibility analysis. So if you want to have a look at them, go to the website, log into the collaboration site, and you will find um, all the info. And um, you can speak to, to the people here, for example, to Arun Schroff, um, who um, has um, a very interesting uh, use cases case for re uh, retinopathy. Um, and, um, so, um, and then tomorrow, or um, no, on Thursday, Professor Klauschen, a pathologist, will come um, to give an up update of the histopathology use case. Um, and um, we have to discuss in the next days whether we will um, keep um, update the call for proposals or have, have it as an ongoing process. We, we need to discuss uh, this. And um, remember, um, yes, remember the April meeting in Shanghai put it in your calendar. And um, what we will do next is to work tower, towards step two of the process. This means we will need now to prepare everything to invite submissions of AI technology. And Naomi mentioned this. Um, the idea of the, this thing is to bring together the um, two communities, which 
if not so much in common, the um, IT or AI guys and the medical community. And now um, we have we we got involved people with uh, with medical data. Um, also, they are uh, prone to to AI technology interested in and have machine learning background. Um, but now it will be the task to um, to also get the AI um, people more involved. And for, for this, it's um, important that the topic drivers or so the people who submit the use cases prepare their use case in such a way that um, um, a machine learner, for example, understand it and understand it, understands the, the problem, understands the data, understands what he, what his machine is supposed to do. All right. So uh, to get involved, submit your data, check um, the call for proposals. Um, uh, let's see whether it will get gets um, uh, updated, and um, submit your AI um, when the call for AI technology is out. Um, thank you, in particular to uh, Marcel for hosting uh, the event at EPFL. Um, join the next days um, in the actual work, so um, in the meeting. Go to the website, um, enter the collaboration site, check, um, check the use cases. It's very interesting um, uh, what is being done and join us in Shanghai. Thank you. So um, I think we have a running mic. So we're getting some, let's consider this now just the opening uh, discussion um, the next half an hour. Please feel free to ask any question. Don't necessarily wait um, until the end of the day. You can see the program on the website. Obviously, there's multiple sessions um, coming up throughout the day. So, but if you want me to pose your question now, even though we specifically see a talk there, please do. This is really sort of the opening, uh, opening uh, discussion. Any questions? Always the first one is always the most difficult one. I, I hope not. Hello, my name is Christian Jeffer from Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin. Um, I'm uh, pleased to be here and I just have a general question on the output. So, um, would you think that um, in the end it will be test data um, in particular? Or can we um, also imagine to formulate this in some lessons learned in order uh, to scale it not only for e-health but for other things? So could there be a, because I think you were a little bit um, um, careful with um, calling for a standard uh, or things like that, but could there be maybe another output um, that uh, describes what you've done and um, in a way develops it into a method? Do you have this question in general, or are you addressing anyone in particular? In, in general. In general. Well, um, I mean, I would very broadly say, um, well, let, let's put it like this. If, if, um, if we walk away from, from this group at the end of the day and we have a, a big lessons learned document um, and not much else, that would obviously be a great disappointment, at least for me personally. Um, um, so, but, but of course, if we manage to get some of these benchmarks established, there will be lessons learned automatically. Um, and whether that exact same process can be used in, in other, um, domains, certainly when it comes to benchmarking AI, I wouldn't, I don't see exactly why that wouldn't be possible. There's certainly some things about health that make it uh, particular and that, that actually also make it perhaps one of the toughest uh, domains to work on. But I would, I would 
expect that certainly the the benchmarking process itself um, is quite transferable. Can I jump in? Yeah. So I, I think um, I, I learned that, for example, TÜV Germany, so they um, check the cars, um, and now the cars are self-driving with machine learning by themselves. And um, yeah, we, uh, we we don't know if they work always or if they, for example, don't like bicycle drivers and you know, with white hats, for example, or some stickers. Um, and so, so what what they do with uh, um, DFKI is uh, to uh, to evaluate such algorithms for self-driving cars. So they started, and um, so the method that we are developing here could or insights from creating this method could be maybe transferred also in this community. And um, as machine learning is now everywhere, or AI, um, I believe all, all, all kinds of other um, communities can learn from the way we do this, because it's, it's not about only these test data, but it's the whole um, ITU process. I mean, it um, has... Uh, a 150 year um, history to to create such uh, standards which are w uh, working uh, worldwide so for example if you watch videos this is because uh, different people came together and create these standards so that's my, my take on this point yeah I'm going to make one last comment so I see two sets that are work one is obviously the kind of Technically, can an AI for health algorithm be benchmarked? Is that possible? Can we set up the process to do it? Is it operationally viable? That's one side. The second is, can these two communities work together and establish a benchmark that fits within that system of um, a company generating an algorithm, its benchmark, we demonstrate uh, some kind of efficacy against the standard it's adopted into practice? So can we make something that facilitates that pipeline and enables this revolution to happen? And that's where I see the greatest potential for learning, almost as a motivational example. So if the focus group can do that, the kind of essential step, which is between this kind of wild west environment and this comparative effect, efficacy that the Lancet kind of deals with, and a lot of the academic publishers and the people who do the standards and benchmarking, if we can do that and we can kind of facilitate this pipeline, I think that really can set the ground for uptake and uh, this kind of revolution that I'm saying hasn't happened. And I think it definitely could be something that could be an example of the communities working, for example, on digital health apps, which I think is still relatively in that kind of, not Wild West as such, but that environment where there are lots of people, there's a mobile, there's lots of apps, and it hasn't necessarily translated to a huge amount of uptake. So obviously the exact operational kind of structure of the focus group might not be translated, but that kind of demonstration of how these two communities can work together, yes, I think that there can be lessons learned in that for other examples. Uh, Marie-Valentine Florin, uh, the International Risk Governance Council here in APFL. I have a question um, regarding regulation, because when an algorithm is embedded in a software and is used for medical diagnostic, it is, gener it is generally considered as software as medical device, which is subject to very scrupulous uh, regulation, in particular US FDA. So the, does the working, the focus group uh, or the, your work connects to the work of uh, the people at FDA or others that uh, address this question, it's heavily regulated, benchmarking is super important and all that. Yeah. Yes, actually, um, um, last at the last meeting in New York, we managed to get um, someone from FDA uh, involved in the group who really wanted to be here, care, um, but um, because of the uh, US government, federal government situation right now, he couldn't be here. Otherwise, he would be here and uh, actively contribute to this. But we're, we're behind uh, the scenes. I mean, we're extremely actively reaching out to the various regulatory bodies because they're absolutely essential. Fully agree with you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm um, Jean-Pierre Hugo from uh, EPFL. Um, so 
it is the first time I'm participating to this uh, focus group, and I, I am really impressed by the ambitions. I, I can only applaud and, and, and support this uh, this idea, one and, and these goals. One thing I'm surprised to not have been mentioned uh, this morning is the fact that the data, the benchmarks, has to be based on patient data. Right? So patient data is something that is immensely sensitive, and a number of regulations that vary from county to country. On, on one hand. On the other hand, if you want to have serious benchmarks, you probably need to have data that are multinational. It's not just one hospital to say, hey, I have this cool data set of 1,000 people, just use it, right? Uh, so this is one dimension. It has to be international in some way. Second thing, uh, this data, I suppose, has to be anonymized. So you, because you don't want to expose the lives of, of specific people on these benchmarks. As we know, anonymization is not possible anymore. Thanks notably to the progress of AI on one hand and of omics on the other hand, right? So uh, how, so I, I'm, I was wondering how much has this been addressed? I know there is a session and I'm going to talk about this, this afternoon, but, but, but I think this is so focal and, and su such a, a major roadblock that it should be mentioned in the, at the very beginning to say, here is a strategy to, to solve those issues. As you know, for example, you take the genomic databases that have been withdrawn from a public reach in 2008 because of the Homer attacks and, and so on. And so, whereas here the benchmarks, I suppose, have to be public, right? They, 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 sh they should not be restricted in terms of access, right? So there's a tension between the willingness to, to make the benchmark fully credible, therefore, publicly accessible, and on the other hand, be compliant with the willingness to respect the privacy of patients. So what, what are, in, in nutshell, the thoughts on this? So but when you say the benchmark has to be public, which part do you mean? I assume, I assume the data has to be, I, I guess, has to be usable by, every, by anyone. Is that correct? No. no. So, the, so the, I think there's a, there's a key difference if you, um, can we maybe bring up that picture? But so there's a, there's a data that's used for training that has to be um, there. We can help, right, to make some data sets public. And that sort of goes to speak to your comment about you can't just take a thousand uh, data points from a hospital. I mean, that actually depends a little bit, right? I mean, if, if those are some CAT scans from a thousand different patients that you can anonymize to the greatest extent possible, that's actually not a bad start, but you know, I, I understand the point that you raise here. But then the test data, the test data on which this will be benchmarked, no, that is not going to be open. It cannot be. But, but I mean, because that, that defies the point, right? It, this must be closed. And so, um, but of course, then you say, okay, but then who's going to trust this? Yeah. This is why, well, this is why this group exists, right? This is why um, this group under the umbrella of WHO and ITU can bring in the various stakeholders that say, okay, we developed this data set, right? And, and, and you know, for each, for each vertical, presumably there's going to be a working group, for example, in dermatology, where you then bring the various stakeholders on board, the, the various dermatological associations and so on that say, okay, you know, we, we can we can bet for this data, right? We can put our name behind this data. We cannot show it to anyone else, but we can we can give our name, so to speak, and our reputation that this is proper data, uh, well annotated, accurate data that does a proper benchmark. And then, of course, there comes a technical question: Okay, but how do you keep this data safe? And this is why we need people like you so much uh, to help us with that, right? Not, 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 on step number one, the training data is public, right? Part of it, can, it should be, I mean, we, we can try to make as much, and we don't have any data, right? I don't have data, Naomi doesn't have data, Marcus doesn't have data. So, but as a group, we can work together to, to work with the various stakeholders. Are there data sets that they feel comfortable making public? By the way, you know, just as a side remark, this health is not, we, we take this as a one health approach, of course, with a human uh, focus, but there is, for example, there was a project submitted that's related to snake bites because snakes uh, are now a major public health threat. Um, so, so there are also those kinds of data that don't necessarily include patient data. But yes, 
Um, yeah, th those are exceptions, fully agree. But, but so the benchmark, I mean, the, the core of my answer is that the benchmark is not public. The data on which it will be evaluated should not be public. That's very essential. But the training data has to be. Training data can be. Can be. If, if, if a community comes along and says, we really want a benchmark in X, you know, any, any vertical, and they say, look, there's, there's lots of players out there and we are happy to come together, right, as the association of X and the global community of X to, for our community, to establish this benchmark. But there just does not happen to be any open data. I think as long as this group uh, trusts this community of X and X is an important problem, I think we should still do it. But ideally we would manage to get some data of X also public so that we can say, okay, let's open this to a much bigger community. But it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a formal requirement. Yeah, I don't want to take too much time, but, but you know, there is, for example, the Beacon project uh, pushed by the G4GH where they've really tried to share data while keeping, keeping it uh, uh, secure. So I think it would be good if, if, if there were some connection established with the, those of the international organization that have already worked on those issues and have come up with some solutions, the vulnerability of which have already been, been studied, by the way, in the meantime. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. My name is uh, Pablo Perel from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I want to, to follow up on, on, on the test uh, date. I mean, first, I mean, congratulate the initiative, but I think uh, here we are to see how we can move forward and, and improve this. And it's about the validation. And of course, I mean, as you were mentioning, I mean, there's a lot of literature on diagnostic and prognostic research that we need to learn from. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the use of AI in limited resource settings and, and, and humanitarian settings, for example, where AI can have a huge impact. The thing is, it's not only to have one external data set. You need to have where you intend to use that AI uh, algorithm. And you need to, to have data sets that are different. So if I'm testing an AI that was developed in the Mayo Clinic and I want to apply it in Gambia as this is one of my projects. Of course, it, it, I need to, to have a data set for, for that setting. And the thing is, we don't have in many of these places uh, data. So we, we need to collect prospectively data. I mean, in, in high income countries, you might have the images. In many resource, uh, limited resource settings, you don't have. So I think probably it's not just one data set and that's, or, or more, and it's more generalized. It's what is your question? What is your intention? where you want to apply this algorithm. And do you have a data set that represents that setting? How does it work in that setting? For that, you will need many different data sets. And then for many places, you will have to uh, try to promote collection of new data because you will not have that. And then this comes to a question that probably you, you, you've been thinking about is, what is incentive for people that have data to share it with you? Uh, because of course, if you have a benchmarking and someone is developing 
AI solutions, they might want to do that. But if you're a researcher with a huge collection of data, why you would like to just put it there in the repository? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's important to find incentive mechanisms for, for the different uh, stakeholders of um, working on this area. So it, it's more like a comment and probably, I mean, you've, you've been, I mean, during the workshop, uh, uh, during the meetings, you will be talking about that, but I think thinking about the test uh, uh, data set is very important. Yeah, can I just come back on your particular example of Mayo Clinic, which I think a, a low resource setting. I mean, I think that's where, when I imagine the use of the benchmark, that it doesn't, you know, we have this discussion between us where, we try and work out the two different communities have these different metrics of success. It's not in health enough just that your uh, that your algorithm has a good predictive accuracy, but also that it works well in the system in which you are envisaging it. So I think that is part of seeing the benchmark as almost the the bar over which you have to pass in order to begin the testing in your setting. Um, I mean, I absolutely understand your point about the validity and generalizability of the algorithm on different data sets in different settings. But I think there's also a kind of system level question because, you know, we discuss, that, for example, prediction of skin cancer. It's not just enough that the algorithm can predict skin cancer accurately in a low income setting. It's also that it does so in a way which uses the resources accurately. It's also that it does so in a way where there is a kind of place for those people to go on and then be treated. So I think it would be impossible for the benchmarking to completely be the only barrier to entry, but I think it's you know a valid part. Also just just one uh, one comment. Um, um, you know, this this is a great comment and um, and something <clears throat> you know I think projects um, like that tend to not think deeply about it. So, which is why I'm very grateful that you bring up this point of incentives, right? Because at the end of the day, everything falls and or stands um, based on the right incentive structure. And, and you know, as, as Naomi also mentioned, I mean, there's always this uh, evolutionary process. You have to start somewhere. And it, there was this important slide that Marcus also had that said um, 2018 to 2020. I don't know how many of you noticed and said and thought, what is going to end in 2020? I mean, that's the just the general way the focus groups are set up. And and um, um, uh, the ITU colleagues here will will correct me if I'm out of my um, league here. But but uh, the fundamental idea of the focus groups is always that you you do this bottom up, right? None of us have been appointed here. It's all voluntary. And we try to find, we say, OK, this is a topic is very important. Here's what would need to happen. And then our goal would be, as this focus group, to make it happen in some verticals where, given all the constraints, one can make a certain progress and define some certain steps where you could then easily see, okay, this actually seems to work. And if, you know, if we had the right resources, the right time frame, we could scale this up massively and then it could become another uh, type of uh, group. But you know your point is fully taken. But I think we have in the beginning we don't if we if we think about um, incentives of how people open their data, you know like everyone else we will spend be spending the next twenty years doing that. So we'd rather say okay we have two years and time is ticking because we're already slowly approaching the end of the first year. Um, who has data and interesting projects that they can where we can show that this process works? And this is also why we had this call. And which we hopefully continue to have, where we already had eight stakeholders that said, "Okay, I have interesting data and and an interesting problem." But point extremely well taken. But sorry, you wanted to say also something. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to say what Marcel also said. It's called focus group, and at the onset, um, the ITU chair Supli, I think, uh, the study group leader, he told us, "Yeah." You have two years, and please focus. And um, so we, we are. Um, I think this also goes in the direction of um, Dr. Diefal's comment that uh, we uh, we develop here like a method that can then be 
transferred. And as you said, it gives us direction and, and hints where, for example, to acquire more data. So um, the focus group is about like ex exploring a new topic. Uh, I am Dr. Shabi from India, and I am an academician, and I am interested in AI. And I am here from first uh, meeting, actually. So I am really happy to see how we are progressing. And now my questions, and actually it's a comment, uh, starting with this uh, framework uh, slide. Usually when we start training data, we're training with the whole set of data sets we are having. So maybe in order to make public, I think we should use the testing data instead of training data. That is like one comment. And other thing is, as our colleague was saying, I really don't need to share the data unless until what I need to share is the what are the input variables and what are my outputs and what is accuracy of my algorithm. And anybody in the world wants to test my algorithm, they can test my, take my algorithm and put their input variables and output variables if they're interested what I am doing. And uh, we need to have like a common data model and they can pr use my algorithm without sharing anything and they can get the results of what I was getting in my data set. So these are the two things uh, I need your opinion on. this. Yeah, so the second part is uh, out of scope of the focus group because we are not um, standardizing the algorithm, algorithms and also the AI developers are not willing to uh, to, uh, to give their um, to, uh, their IP because it could be a reverse engineered, for example. So I think this won't work. And the first question I did not. First thing was about the own uh, data, which is private and public is training data set. Usually we train our models with whole data, not a small portion of. Uh, data which I am processing in order to improve my accuracy. So you, so you train your model also on the test? With the whole data set which I am processing, not only a small data set. So, but uh, I mean, that, that's, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't need to know the details, but in general, um, right, one does not train their data, uh, their models on data that one then later evaluates on, because obviously then yeah, that's that, like training and uh, yeah, validating yeah. data set. Exactly. Right. So, um, so I mean, any data in this test data must not be published, and so as as long as there is a clear separation, uh, I think it's it's fine. And and as I mean, also right. It's important to uh, realize that each benchmark will probably be set up slightly differently because you're dealing with very different problems. You're dealing with the very different things you want to quantify. So the exact details of what is input, what is output, what are the rules, what are the constraints will be different for every benchmark that's pretty much guaranteed. So there's not much... Um, in terms of details there that we can standardize. I think the standardization here is more in the process of how this can work and then each, every single case um, benchmark needs to be uh, adapted. Also it's a terminology thing, so maybe you're also uh, raising this question because of terminology. So some people have training data, test data and validation data and um, in New York I learned also that uh, the physicians have a different uh, naming scheme. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hello, hi. My name is Imad. Um I'm 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 very interested in everything that's been spoken about today. Like it's, it's it's my first time being part of this workshop. I just wanted to ask a question about um has there been an interaction with the industry to learn a bit bit more about some I wouldn't say exactly like the same frameworks, but similar technological frameworks that were used. Like I'm thinking about like Kaggle, I'm thinking about um, Crowd AI, I'm thinking also about uh, maybe Quantopian, but it's more in finance, but like places where people just kind of submit their data and then you've got da data scientists or AI professionals competing because they also kind of do this separation between like some test data that is provided and some data that is kind of kept on the side and I'm just thinking, like, is there has there been an interaction? Has there been any learnings from what they've done, just so that we can like bootstrap or kind of 
accelerate a bit more kind of that component of, of, of the work that you guys are doing? Well, um, yeah. So the uh, the answer is yeah, because I mean I, I've been deeply involved in 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 the crowd AI, but also you know many members of my lab and possibly also here have competed in in all kinds of different challenges. So um, the learnings from there, um, we are I mean yeah, come somewhat naturally, but but we're this group again is extremely open to any input from uh, from any stakeholder. Um, I know we have industry here today. We had industry in the room for, for the last couple of meetings as well. Um, that's something you know that's that's um, that's definitely happening. I mean, we're we're open to to any form of input from wherever it comes, as long as it's clear where it comes from. Um, we are we are open. Yeah, I'm uh, Saurav. I'm a cardiologist from uh, India. Uh, it's very interesting to listen to all the benchmarking ideas which we have from the focus group. But uh, are we going to work like something uh, which uh, the FIND from WHO work, which is Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics, which actually validates newer tools for medical diagnosis. And once it is validated by FIND, then it is implied to, I mean, apply, applied to other countries in the world. So are we, are we uh, working on those lines? So um, this is something that needs to be discussed with WHO. Um, and um, Because that, that seems like a good idea. That, that, that does seem like a good idea. Same, yeah. I don't know if uh, Ramesh or, um, or um, anyone, anyone else like Samir so are, are here or could, um, is on remote. So can we hear him? Samir, are you here? Well, but okay, I mean, um, you know, long story short, I mean, that's, so first of all, that's a decision, of course, that WHO has to make. But second, that to the best extent that I understand it, that is part of the goal also here, right? To sort of get, I mean, if, if, um, if for example, there is some way by which the results of these benchmarks um, flow into some kind of pre-approval process or what have you, I don't know the details, frankly, um, at uh, how this works at WHO, then this thing will have teeth, right? Otherwise, it will have a bit uh, fewer teeth. So that is the idea. Uh, but yes. but so I, 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 I mean, yeah. obviously speak on behalf of WHO. I wish someone were here. So maybe maybe during the meeting we can work around that yeah. because if if that 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 is the mandate of the group, then it works well. Otherwise, we we are not sure where we are heading to. Uh, so yes and no, right? So it's it's very important that this um, again to underline that the focus group runs under nobody's mandate and that this is also its its strength. I mean, all of us are here. Um, because we came together and we decided we wanted to do this, and we did this under the guidance of the ITU focus group instrument. Um, but there is no top-down mandate that tells us what we have to do. Once this goes into another format, then that you know that that may change and, and things may become more formal. But at this stage, the focus group has no top-down mandate. It's all what we as a group decide we should. Thank you. Hi, Marcel. Sorry, this is Samir. Hi. Uh, Can you hear me? Hi, uh, Arun Shroff. Uh, happy to be here for the second uh, or the third meeting. I was there on the last one. Uh, Marcel, question for you, actually. Uh, it's interesting that you brought in fairness into the benchmarking. And I'm just curious to understand a little better on how Touch upon a little bit and how you plan, how we plan to do that in the focus group. Yeah, so I mean it's obviously an extremely big topic, and um, it would not do it justice, um, you know, to right. to to wrap it up in one one minute, minute answer. But the the bigger picture a bit is, you know, whenever you say AI, there's only only so much time until somebody will raise their hand and say ethics and for good reasons right as we've seen and learned in the past two three years and so um, in, in my view and others have similar or different views and this is obviously open to discussion 
one of the biggest issues, certainly when it comes to to benchmarking, is this whole notion of of bias. And um, th there's also elements of transparency, which I think we will not be entirely able to address as part of this benchmarking framework, because it is not, because that's, first of all, it's, it's very hard to do from a technical perspective. Even if you have um, unlimited access to the models, you can just go in and, uh, and then assume you understand them any better. But the minimum that we can do, right, is to work to ensure that this, this test data set is as unbiased as possible. Because that means then that every benchmark that is supposed to perform well has to work, has to be performing well on that unbiased data set. That makes the whole process fair, right? So, I mean, to go to the example of the of the skin cancer is a well-known problem, as also a colleague from Imperial has mentioned, that a lot of the data comes, obviously, from uh, healthcare systems in healthy population, which historically have been concentrated around Caucasian skin. And so now, as a consequence, a lot of these images are on you know, skin of Caucasian origin. And so, but of course, any algorithm that's supposed to work well and fair should work well independent of the ethnicity. And so if we can now set up a test set that, you know, reflects these different ethnicities, then any algorithm that wants to perform well must be able to take that into account. Right, okay. I think uh, Samir was trying to get Yeah, me. I heard Samir also. Samir, are you there? Yes, I, yes, I'm here, Marcel. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So, um, did you hear the question uh, previously? I did briefly, um, but uh, and I can make a statement uh, or inform what, what we've been discussing in the past time, but if I haven't completely heard the question, please please let me know afterwards. Or we can so, repeat so it. Marcel, can point out correctly uh, what the plan is, and I think you answered the question very clearly, uh, what any other show person would do it. Uh, we are in the process of learning. This is the first time we went to WHO, and the objective is that we form a benchmark which can be then applied for, for a broader WHO approach. We have started to build on a pre-qualification mechanism as well at WHO, and so we want this uh, these, the knowledge of this uh, working uh, this, this um, focus group to feed into that um, process as well. So I think the answer to the, that, what Master gave us, was apt. It's, there's no clear relation at this stage, but we are hoping that this would guide that work and the inputs from and the, the structure that's done uh, with this this work will, will help us shape um, more or less the work going forward for which on AI terms. Does that answer the question that was raised? Yeah, yeah, I think so, Samir. Uh, I was just asking whether we are trying to simulate something what FIND does for WHO in terms of validating uh, the medical tools for diagnosing diseases. Well, it's not only one stream. I think WHO has several uh, angles of looking. Diagnostic tools is one part of it, um, but there's several areas of prevention, management, disease uh, interventions, and I think I think we need to keep it more generic, not just specific for device um, or diagnostic tools itself. Uh, and I think that's what the gen the challenge is to keep it as generic as possible, but also make it applicable, and then we adapt it for the specific streams uh, and areas as as best needed. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, um, uh, my name is Alina Vanek. Um, I'll talk about legal questions later, but uh, what I would want to clarify is um, in order for a benchmarking to function well, is it necessary that you only have the undisclosed data set or is it also mandatory that you would have the open uh, set of test, uh, test data? This was a little bit unclear for me. What was the relationship of these two data sets for the functionality of the benchmarking process? Thank you. So cru crucial are the undisclosed, is it on? Do you hear me? So crucial for the benchmarking procedure is the undisclosed test data. Um, the public, as well, so the AI developers, they need at least a few training or public examples to check that their 
algorithms are processing can can load the data and process it and um so they they need to have at least some some examples um even better of course it is if they are it could be also from a different source some public uh, um, um a website that there, there are other public data sets available this helps them to to get involved to train their um, algorithm but but it's not not necessary okay thank you and we're really happy to have you here because we really need some legal help um <laughs> and i'm not just saying this as a joke but um, you know, in benchmarking, as as a colleague from uh, from your department reminded me, there's there's a history of legal complications. Um, for example, that uh, after some database have have been publicly benchmarked, the database went vendors went ahead and put the put a clause in their um, terms of use that um, they must not be benchmarked. And so um, if we can you know, get some legal clarity from the beginning, I think that would, that'll be very helpful. Hi, um, um, I'm Siddhartha from Fundacion Botnar. Thanks a lot for this uh, great work you are doing. Uh, but I have a question regarding that very important statement that you had and relates to some of the questions uh, with unbiased data in, in the test set. And unbiased data is the holy grail probably. But since we none of us here, as you pointed out, owns sort of or generates data and we are hoping to get data from elsewhere, uh, we will probably in the beginning take whatever sort of comes to us. Um, and so have you considered sort of changing that goal of having unbiased test set data, which might be really problematic for some of the conditions that you are hoping to benchmark um, with different ethnic geographical uh, you know, considerations um, than just arising out of a single clinic somewhere. So have you considered actually instead of not in, instead of disclosing the test data, there's a, something else that you could do is making the bias in the test data explicit. So actually people will not, you know, because otherwise there'll be a credibility issue. Some algorithms will work very well in the local context world, but will fail your benchmarking because your data, your test set data is not representative or is not completely unbiased. But if you make the bias explicit, then that will sort of give some kind of, you know, that will that lower the bar a little bit, but introduce more transparency in the entire benchmarking process. So have you considered this? Uh, yeah, that's just a comment. Yeah, th this is an excellent point. Um, so one step which is really crucial is that um, the data generation and uh, annotation slash labeling procedure are um, completely detailed and documented. That um, so we we don't publish the test data, but we publish the protocol that allows people to uh, to create test data as well as training data, and um, um, then we will not create a, like a heap, or a, we will not put all the the data just together. But for example, it's conceivable that we have um, we benchmark on diff different um, data subsets, and we we will um, declare, for example, this um, this uh, data set was generated in Mayo Clinic only, and then um, it's transparent that this is not a general general generalizable um, benchmark that it just works for this um, uh, area, and um, of course it's. Um, um, we're trying to to create a whole community around these use cases, and um, there are several examples of um, of use cases where the the data providers are from from different continents. Yeah. Uh, 
both measurements for children. Then when you go to the communities that are using these, for example, I, I did some work in Mexico, these are very only used, and, but you know, we know that Mexican babies are small. So actually they used, but there's a kind of open acknowledgement of the limitation. So I think that's the current study that lets you that size. And so the goal of this kind of fairness and ambition is actually incredibly ambitious that we really set forward from where we currently are. So ways and the stepping stones are the way I Do we have one more? Um, we, we may have multiple more, so, but um, otherwise, um, let's um, let's go to the break and um, let's then be back at eleven fifteen. And before we go, I, I totally forgot to mention a great shame on myself um, that there is going to be a dinner reception tonight that's um, very graciously sponsored by the Swiss government. Just wanted to mention that. <laughs> So um, see you at 11.15. We'll start the second session, use cases and data availability with uh, colleagues from Baidu, NHS, and so on. So see you half an hour. Coffee should be here now.